The Secret of the Old Clock takes place in 1930. When I first heard this, I thought it was a stupid gimmick, but it's actually kind of interesting and works really well. We have travelogue games, where Nancy visits another country and learns random things about their culture and history. This is the same basic thing, except she's visiting another time, not another place. I would totally be up for it if Nancy time traveled again. Instead of starting with a letter like the other games, this one starts with an old-timey announcer voice saying, The year is 1930! It's funny and makes for a unique intro. Nancy is visiting an orphan named Emily Crandall. We get some brief clips of her. These clips come from the first five minutes of the game, which I dislike. It feels somewhat lazy to reuse animation for the opening scene, and it's especially noticeable when the two animations are so close together. Compare this to the ending scene, which reuses a picture of Topham, but it's not noticeable, because those scenes are at least 20 minutes apart. So I'd recommend using different shots of Emily in the opening scene, or at least just flip or reverse the animations of Emily in the opening. Make it a little less obvious that it's reused. Nancy parks her car and goes inside the Lilac Inn, where she meets Jane Willoughby. It's odd that there's a character named Jane in back-to-back -back games, and in both games she's the culprit. Jane is kind of a funny-looking character, in my opinion. Her hair looks fake. The way she talks is a little off, too. She's half doing a high-pitched 1930s voice. It works, but if she was talking like that in a modern-day game, it would be pretty strange. Jane uses a lot of old slang, which is neat. It's like Tommy Tucker in the previous game. I half wish there were slang translations somewhere, because I don't understand them all. Like Jane says, Oh, well, Emily probably needs to hang out with a bear cat like you instead of some dumb Dora like me. Bear cat? Dora? Who's Dora? Turns out she's a character from a comic strip. Dumb Dora. But you don't need to know that to get the general sense of what Jane is saying, which is that Emily needs to hang out with someone her own age. I am glad that the 1930s slang is mostly limited to Jane. If everyone in the game talked like that all the time, it'd drive me crazy and I'd hate it. Jane gives you an information dump. She's Emily's temporary guardian. Nancy's father just called for her. Emily has been acting oddly recently. And the Lilac Inn is a restaurant, not an inn. The name comes from the books. It's too good not to use. This game is advertised as being based on the first Nancy Drew book ever. That's not true. It is a vague combination of the first four Nancy Drew books. We have Book 1's culprit living in Book 2's house, while Book 3's culprit lives in Book 4's house. That's why the two culprits in this game don't interact at all. They have completely unrelated storylines, because they come from totally different books. They definitely could have tried harder to connect the two storylines, but while the plot is a little weak, it's the same basic story as the last three games. Nancy does everyone else's chores while solving a large scavenger hunt, which leads to treasure. That basic plot seems to work well, no matter what the game is. The Lilac Inn is an okay place. The scenery in this game is fine. Nothing pops out at me as being particularly fancy or interesting to look at, like the scenery in Curse of Blackmore Manor or the final scene. The parlor has a newspaper about hobo sign language, and Bard Bounce, which is a slider puzzle. You want to slide the pieces around, so the green piece is in the green spot, red in the red spot. We saw the same puzzle in Treasure in a Royal Tower. I like it. It's kind of tricky, but in a good way. There is no reset button, so if you get really stuck with all the pieces in place except one, you just have to deal with it. You don't want to back away and restart the puzzle, because it costs five cents every time you play. Whew, big money. The parlor has an old clock on the mantel. Inside is another slider puzzle, this one reused from the final scene. You want to move the unique piece to the other side of the board by moving all the other pieces out of the way? Again, I'd say it's kind of tricky in a good way. I'm fine with them reusing these puzzles. They're still good. Emily's bedroom is upstairs. She's sitting by the window wearing a nightgown. Her legs never move, and it looks like she's in the fetal position. Just by looking at her, you get the sense that she's slightly immature, not grown up enough yet to run her own business. She also gives the sense that something is strange, slightly off. So I'd say they did a great job with Emily's character design. It matches her story perfectly. The voice matches too. She's young, overwhelmed, and confused. Emily thanks you for the card you sent when her mother died. That was really nice of Nancy. 
Emily suddenly interrupts you, and we get a close-up of Emily's face. Her eyes move around. It's actually kind of freaky. She says, I thought I heard something, and gives no explanation beyond that. Emily wants Nancy to hide some jewelry for her, and that's when the kitchen explodes. The timing is a little off. There's no way the culprit had enough time to get from the hidden passageway all the way to the kitchen, then make it explode during this brief conversation. Emily stands up and listens for a moment before leaving. This is the clip that was in the opening. I told you they were close together. We see Emily from behind as she walks towards the door. This animation is only half a second long, which I find strange. It's a unique angle of Emily and the room. For such a brief period of time, it makes you wonder why they put it in the game to begin with. Maybe they just wanted to confirm that Emily knows how to stand up? Compare this to the next shot, which is an animation of the kitchen door leading into Jane shaking her head. That's a much longer shot. The fire chief says someone left a burner on in the kitchen. Now the kitchen is totally destroyed and they might have to go out of business. Jane says Emily did use the stove last, and she's been very forgetful lately. Oh sure, blame the crazy person. Emily screams. It turns out that all her jewelry was stolen, and we suddenly transition into the main storyline of the game. Josiah Crowley was their rich next-door neighbor. He did wacky things, like enjoy mini-golf and dress up as Great Aunt Harriet. He promised to leave Emily a bunch of money, which is great, but his will is hidden behind a huge scavenger hunt which is not great. After a few months, Richard Topham said, I found Josiah's will. He changed his mind at the last minute and left everything to me. Trust me, I wouldn't lie about this. I found the will with my psychic powers. Topham is obviously lying, but Nancy appears to be the only one who's suspicious of him. Emily asks Nancy to go into town and talk to Jim Archer, the banker. Emily would normally visit him herself, but Nancy's the main character of the game, so she should do it. Jane is surprised to hear about the robbery. Nancy suggests Jane is the culprit because she's literally the only other person at the inn. Jane makes the good point that the culprit could be almost anyone who knew about the jewelry. Jane also says she never plays miniature golf, and suddenly, I like her much better. When you go towards Topham's, a piece of paper floats by. Nancy has to grab it. I believe you get two chances to do this before it lands on the ground. The paper is a receipt for a key appraisal from Waddell. You can call Waddell and ask him about the receipt, but there's no point. All he does is yell at you to visit his store. But it's neat how the game gives you the option of calling him. When Nancy steps into Topham's house, he calls her by name without turning to look at her. This is supposed to make it seem like he's psychic? But really, it makes him seem like a jerk. He's playing with spoons instead of looking at you. That's a jerk move. He tells you to find the toy mouse for his cat. The poor cat is hideous. I feel kind of bad for it. Topham is probably a terrible cat owner. He'd rather play with spoons than take care of his cat. You have to search for the mouse because there are three places where it could be. Topham's house is probably the most interesting location of the game. It has lots of random, interesting things to see, like noisemakers and a carousel horse and a stuffed parrot. I like Topham's character design. His hair is just wild, and that silly little bow tie really seals the deal for me. And maybe it's just me, but I think he's got a little bit of stubble going on. He should shave. Topham thanks you for your help, and he launches into a speech about his fabulous psychic powers. He uses a bunch of long, strange words. I think he's either trying to impress Nancy or confuse her. When Nancy says she's not interested in his business, Topham abruptly dismisses her. He refuses to talk to her anymore unless Nancy proves she's smart enough by solving a series of simple word puzzles. Above Topham's fireplace is a clock. This is a simple memory game where you make matches. It's reused from Danger on Deception Island, but I like it better in this game. Solving the puzzle gets you a mirror. On the desk is an elephant. You have to pull its trunk to find Josiah's secret journal. He left all the clues for a scavenger hunt inside. There's a four-part puzzle to get into the carriage house. You need to win Bard Bounce, win a round of mini-golf, see the author of the book in Emily's room, and ask Emily what her mother's middle name is. She says it's Lois, and she reminds you to call your father. That is so bossy, it usually makes me decide not to call Mr. Drew. The next page of the journal explains how Topham's word puzzles work. The example is fall, written from up to down, so it's fall down. I like these puzzles. I kind of wish we had another set of them in a later game. 
The various characters in the game will say the answers out loud, which is a nice subtle clue. The next page says, to open journal, decoder is in the r rivet to the right. I assume that means the letter T is two letters after the letter R. So you replace the R with T, getting decoder is in the trivet. Great! I have no idea what a trivet is. The last page of the journal is weird. It has a picture on how to find the journal, which makes no sense because you can't read it unless you've already found it. There's also a blurry note about Josiah's trivet at Twin Elms. It's a little redundant to have that in addition to rivet to, to the right, but here's a strange thing. This same note is on the typewriter ribbon in Jim Archer's bank, so we have three clues about the trivet. Maybe the testers were confused about the trivet, and they added extra clues to make it more obvious that it's important? I don't know. In between Lilac Inn and Mr. Topham's is a miniature golf course. Oh, swell! Press the button for a golf club and ball. It's neat how the ball arrives through a pneumatic tube. That's a nice animation. A scorecard costs 10 cents. You want to get par or under to win. Junior mode has a higher par. Miniature golf is terrible, and I am terrible at it. It takes forever to win this game. The cheater strategy is to save and reload in between every hole until you get a good score. The first hole is pretty simple. There's a rock in the middle. You either aim left or right of the rock to reach the hole. The second hole requires you to bounce off walls. This highlights the main weakness of miniature golf. Corners! The game cannot handle corners. If your ball's at the edge of the screen, you can't move your mouse far enough to hit it. You're forced to give the ball several tiny taps in a row before you can make a normal size swing. It's a pain. The other big pain for me is when the ball goes right over the hole, but doesn't go in. Nancy says, oh, I hit it too hard. Just because the ball is moving fast, that doesn't mean the hole stops existing. I hate it when Nancy whines at me about missing the hole, especially because whenever I try to hit the ball softly, it doesn't move at all, and I just wasted a stroke. The third hole has a sand pit and a bar. If you land in the sand pit, you'll get stuck for a while. And it's hard to avoid the sand pit, because there's not a lot of room to maneuver in between the bar and the sand pit. Luckily, there's a hidden tunnel on the right. You can get it for an easy hole in two. The fourth hole has three holes and walls to navigate. You want to land on the hole on the left. It gives you a victory and a half-minute cutscene. It's a nice cutscene, but it's so long. When you're bad at mini-golf, you have to watch it over and over again. I don't like it. It feels like this was just an excuse to test out the minecart challenge from the end of Last Train to Blue Moon Canyon. If there was a way to skip this animation, that would be better. If you land in a different hole, you get sent to part two, where you have to go around a diamond. The fifth hole has a crab that you need to go around, and there's no easy way to do so while landing in a perfect position for the hole. The hole is on a narrow slope, and because it's narrow, it's easy to mess up and have the ball hit the walls. Lining up this shot is tough. I usually have to spend a shot just lining up this shot. Part 2 has a larger slope. It's fairly simple, but if you hit the ball too hard, it will bounce off the wall and then go down the slope. The problem is you have to hit the ball hard to get it up the slope in the first place, so... Ah. The last hole forces you to go through a tiny gap between bricks, then hope to get a double bounce into the hole. Part 2 has a little valley area where your ball can get stuck, but it's harder to get stuck here than in hole 5 slope. If you win miniature golf, you get a pony. The good news is both miniature golf and bard bounce are totally optional. The game doesn't check if you got all four answers to the carriage house. It only checks if you got the last answer. You can enter Keen, Omar, and Pony into the carriage house lock at any time. The game will accept it. But you can't enter Lois until Emily tells you about it. You open the carriage house. On the table is an old clock, which matches the game near the golf course. This is also an optional puzzle. If you know the answer, you can enter it right away. The golf puzzle requires you to find out the colors of four golf balls. You, you move the balls on the tees and hit check. The game tells you if you got any right colors and if any of them are in the right spot. You get eight chances and you use the wrong answers to help you figure out the right answers. This puzzle can be tough, but I like it. It's a good one. When you solve it, you get a poem with highlighted words. Josiah's notebook says the words sound like numbers. That's your clue to enter the numbers into the clock. Uh, the poem and the clock have the same color scheme, which is a subtle clue they're related. Solving the puzzle gets you a third mirror. Uh, the first time you go into town, Nancy notes that the car from earlier is gone. I think this is a bad subplot for two reasons. First, it's easy to miss out on the subplot because it has fairly specific triggers. 
You have to look at the picture of the car in Jim Archer's office, ask him about it, and he says, Oh, a car you saw was definitely not mine. Then you need to look at the calendar when you're snooping in Topham's house. Mr. Archer will freely confess he lied about the car. He was at the Lilac Inn at the time of the robbery. Like I said, it's easy to miss this subplot since there's no obvious connection between Archer's car and Topham's calendar. The second problem with this subplot is that this comes out almost at the end of the game. It doesn't work to introduce Jim Archer as a suspect in the final conversation with him. If this conversation happened earlier on, it would have been better. As it is, I totally missed out on the car subplot the first five times I played this game, and so I had no idea Mr. Archer is supposed to be a suspect. Especially because he's tied to Mr. Topham, an obvious culprit. If you don't call Nancy's father, he automatically calls you the first time you return from town. Dad asks you to pick up some papers from Tubby Telegrams, and he gives you a lecture on how to drive. It was really neat to hear Nancy's dad for the first time, and the voice is perfect. Stern and dad-like, he's a good combination of helpful and concerned. The coin phone is neat in general. There's an operator every time you pick up the phone, and a nosy neighbor listens in on the phone calls with Bess and George. The game does a good job with the premise of making phone calls in 1930. I like it so much, I don't miss Nancy's cell phone in this game. The bottom of the screen replaces her phone with a change purse. This is the first game where Nancy carries money around and buys things, a feature we'll see many more times. I think the money aspect works great, and it highlights the fact that the game takes place in the Great Depression. I like how money is automatically added or deducted from your purse, because it would be annoying to constantly open and close your purse in this game. I also like how the cursor changes to indicate you're interacting with money. I like driving. It is fun. You move the car around with your mouse or keyboard arrows, and you stop somewhere by pressing the space bar. A cow sometimes appears on the road by the farms, which is cute. If you run over too many potholes, you get a brief tire changing challenge. It's kind of fun. Way more fun than changing a tire in real life. You can buy a new spare tire from the gas station for $2. Whew. And if you run out of gas, I think they charge $3 for a tow. If you don't have the money to pay for that, and let's face it, who does? You're forced to solve a torturous puzzle where you have to sort 30 different bolts into 12 spots. They all look very similar, and if you make too many mistakes, you have to start over. This puzzle is a pain. I know they made it a pain on purpose to punish you for being a bad driver, and it works. I never want to run out of gas now. When you go to Tubby Telegrams, Nancy gets a job as a telegram delivery person. She gets 25 cents per delivery, which is a good deal, but if you're bad at delivering telegrams, most of your salary will go towards buying gas. The map in Nancy's inventory doesn't list every place in town, so you have to do a little bit of exploring. When Nancy delivers telegrams, almost everyone mentions giving her a tip, then they don't. The people in this town are teasing her with the false promise of money, the jerks. When you visit Mr. Waddell, he says the receipt is for Jim Archer's key. He charges you $1.50 for it. Jim Archer is right next door at the Main Street Bank. Mr. Archer is your generic good-looking guy behind a desk. Okay, maybe he's not supposed to be super handsome, but he is a pleasant fellow with glasses, suspenders, and an upbeat attitude. Until someone calls, then he gets sad and upset. Poor Mr. Archer. I like how he turns around to answer phone calls. It's a minor change from the usual character stands in place and stares at Nancy pose. Mr. Archer expresses his sympathy for the fire, and he explains the jewelry wasn't insured. He was surprised by the contents of Josiah's will, but refuses to discuss the matter with a random teenager like Nancy. He says Josiah has a safe deposit box, which was never opened. Since the key is lost, I guess the bank will be forced to keep the locked box forever. On the wall is a signed photo of Clara Pickford. She's an old woman who took a shine to Mr. Archer. This picture can be easy to overlook, and it's the only time Clara Pickford is mentioned. She comes up again at the very end of the game. I imagine that confused a lot of players who either forgot about her or never saw her picture to begin with. It sure confused me. The clock in the corner is locked. Mr. Archer gives you permission to open it with the key. Inside is a gears puzzle, where you put ten gears into place so they all connect. 
The gears are of varying sizes, and there are tiny lines that indicate where two gears touch. This is an okay puzzle. My problem is that you have to put the gears on the pegs, but Nancy's cursor automatically jumps to the center of each gear, so you can't see where the hole in the gear is, so you can't get it on the peg. I've definitely missed the pegs a few times with the larger gears. It's not a big problem, but it's still a pain that they unintentionally made the puzzle harder because the cursor auto-moves. Speaking of which, Nancy's cursor automatically jumps to the center of the text box in this game, and the previous game. After every line of dialogue, the cursor just moves to the center. I have no idea why. Next game, they go back to the cursor not constantly resetting its position. That's much better. Twin Elms is in the upper left corner of the map when you go to it, and the other places for the challenge, you get a black and white photo of the building. That's a nice touch. They could have had the conversations without any pictures, just like they do when you deliver telegrams. The stuffy Mrs. Sheldon agrees to give you the trivet if you get her bridge cards from Miss Joukowsky. This is a long fetch quest, which I don't like. It's a pain, and it feels like an excuse to stretch out the overall game time. To be fair, you only have to visit four people, but you have to visit each person twice, and two of them make you find items for them. I don't like being sent from person to person to person to person. That's doing chores so you can do chores so you can do chores. Mr. Waddell is so much better. You go to him, you get what you want, and leave. Done. I think I'd like to challenge more if it was slightly different. Say, Josiah gave each of these four people a code word. You'd still have to visit all four and do their challenges, but the premise would be, you're solving the mystery, not you're doing a huge chore. Mr. Joukowsky says you can get the cards if you get the raffle tickets from the orphanage. Mrs. O'Shea tells you to get her five toys. You can get the toys from the general store for 25 cents a piece, or you can win them by playing mini golf. Win mini golf five times? Is that even possible? Mrs. O'Shea is funny. She tries to stop one of the wild children from eating a pine cone. I laughed. It is funny. But then she says she doesn't have the tickets you came for. Way to waste my time, Mrs. O'Shea. You should pay me back for the gas and toys I spent on you. Mr. Phelps at the print shop wants a 19-inch largemouth bass, so you go to the pond for a fishing challenge, which is admittedly nice. The guide to fishing is in the carriage house, and you have to go all the way back there to look at it. That's less nice. You have to choose the right bait and the right area to fish in, which is a minnow in the reeds. If you do that, you automatically win. Take the fish to Mr. Phelps for the tickets, which you take to Mr. Joukowsky for the cards, which you take to Mrs. Sheldon. She gives you the trivet and insults Nancy's dress. Nancy says, I like this dress. It's very flouncy. I like that little character moment. It says a lot about Nancy's personality. I don't think the Nancy Drew from The Silent Spy would react like that after being insulted. The trivet is weird looking. It has pictures that are labeled with letters for a puzzle later on. When you get all four mirrors from Josiah's four clocks, you take them to the carriage house and put them in the corners. You can solve the domino puzzle before or after getting the mirrors. It's a simple puzzle. Just place the dominoes so the numbers match. Five is next to five. Seven is next to seven. I generally move everything out of the way and work from the bottom up. I could swear a few times I've solved this puzzle and the game didn't accept my solution. Arr. When you solve it, you get a lever. Pull the lever to let light into the room. You get a puzzle addressing the mirrors. Click on a mirror to move it left and right. You want the light to bounce off all the mirrors and finish on the light bulb. I liked this challenge. It was unique and interesting. Solving it gives you a cool looking animation where a hidden ladder is revealed. It goes to the top floor where there are more puzzles. There's a note that says L. Watt is in Marcel's band. L. Watt? L. What? I don't know what that is. L. W. A. T. is Last Will and Testament. I think they should have just written Will here instead of using a legal acronym. Topham tells you Marcel is Josiah's favorite hat, which was given to Gloria. Ask Emily, the hat is in the drawer below her. There's a key in the hat band, which no one noticed until just now. Strange, especially considering that Topham says Gloria wanted to search the hat. When you take the key to Mr. Archer, he says you can use it if you finish a dress for his wife. Luckily, this isn't another long fetch quest. Mr. Archer confesses he can't afford a real seamstress because the bank is almost out of money. He's so sad he puts his head in his hands. Poor Mr. Archer. This is why I don't consider him a suspect. He's just too sad. Around this time, Emily says the things in her room move and she hears strange noises. She wants Nancy to leave, but Nancy insists on staying. Who knows? 
Maybe she'll be good at solving mysteries. Ha 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 ha. Jane thinks Emily is definitely crazy. She refuses to sew the dress for you, but she promises to give you the needle if you sort some pies on the porch. The instructions are added to Nancy's inventory. It's a big logic puzzle. I like to sort all the cherry pies first and the blueberry and chocolate. I know some people hate this puzzle, but I think it's great. I, I like logic puzzles, and I would rather solve three variations of this puzzle than do mini golf once. Nancy tells you when you're done. Uh, when you go back inside, you can look at the clock in the corner. It's weird because the pendulum hides the clue for the mirrors puzzle. It doesn't help to give players a clue for a puzzle they've already solved. That makes twice now. This and the elephant's trunk. They should have made that clue accessible earlier in the game. When you look at Jane's podium uh, while she's gone, it has a picture of two brothers pulling a lantern in the secret passage. The back of the picture says, Door in the Window Parlor Seat. I like how the game gives you the option to discover the hidden passageway on your own without seeing this clue. After Nancy first talks to Mr. Archer, the curtain in the parlor is askew. Click on it to find the passage. The hidden passage leads all the way to Mr. Topham's living room. There's an old piggy bank with a dollar in the passageway, as well as a jigsaw puzzle. You want to rotate the pieces and swap them. It's an okay puzzle. Definitely better than the weird rabbit jigsaw puzzle from the last game. Get all the pieces in place to form a graveyard picture, and you get a record for Creepy's Corner. You're supposed to play the record on Emily's record player. This gives you a story that's more weird than creepy. It's about Peter and his arch enemy Nick, who can turn into a warthog. They get into a fight over coins, and it's so weird, I'm strangely entertained by it, even though it is way too long. There are many sound effects which match the pictures on the trivet. The sound effects spell out the password, GOODFELLOW. I didn't make the connection between the record and the trivet when I first played the game. The clue is that there's a similar design on the record, the trivet, and the cover to the tile puzzle. This was so subtle, I missed it. Maybe they should have put a clue inside Josiah's notebook, because the notebook's clue about this puzzle is CC is in the tunnel. That's it. It's not a useful clue. The Creepy's Corners puzzle in the passageway is so big, it's hard to miss. A clue connecting the trivet to the record would have been better. The other record has Bridget's song from the last game. That's nice. When Nancy sees the picture from Jane's podium, she can pull the lantern in the tunnel. This reveals a second hidden passageway, leading to Emily's bedroom. That explains how the culprit spies on Emily and moves things in her room. I really wish Nancy got to tell Emily about this passageway, but I think she only mentions it to Jane. Just like the jewelry, Jane claims anyone could be responsible, not just me. Nancy doesn't press the issue. Emily leaves her room, and you can check her drawer. There's a letter from Josiah which contains Bottom's Clue. There's also a letter from Jane which casually mentions a bad apple named Marion Aborn who snoops through people's purses. Jane gives you the sewing needle. Use it on the sewing machine, which is another painfully difficult puzzle, especially on senior mode. You want to move the dress left and right along the dotted line. There's no way to change the speed of the sewing machine. This normally takes me at least five minutes. And if it wasn't for mini golf, this would stand out as the worst puzzle of the game. When you fix the dress, Mr. Archer lets you open the safe deposit box. Inside is a locked journal, which matches the trivet. Enter the password GOODFELLOW to get the ham radio numbers for Flute, Fisby, and Pyramus. Their cues are in Topham's copy of A Midsummer Night's Dream, but he refuses to let you see the play, so you have to steal it. This is a cool segment. Nancy goes in through the secret passageway, but the cat sees her. You have to find the toy mouse and give it to the cat. Otherwise, there's a game over sequence. You also get this game over if you play with the noisemakers, if you take too long, or knock over the vase. It is a weird game over sequence. Topham peeks out his door. Then we see him from below as a yellow light pulsates in the background. Why is there a big flashing light? Is he secretly doing a dance party in there? If you listen uh, to his psychic lesson while you're snooping, you can hear it. It's really silly. I like it. It's funny. Nancy looks through the book, and she finds the three cues. Time to use the ham radio! And you could have started this earlier. There's a note by the radio which says it needs a quartz crystal cut by Waddell. Topham has the quartz, but he won't give it to you unless you prove he's telepathic. 
He's going to shuffle five cards with symbols on them and project his thoughts into your brain so you know which card is which. This is stupid. Topham is stupid and he says stupid things during this puzzle. You go, girl. Very good. Here's another. I'm not your cat, Topham. Don't talk to me like your cat. You know what card to pick based on the question Topham asks? For example, this is which card might refer to the square card. The solution is randomized, so you can't look it up on the internet. You actually have to keep track of his questions and answers to figure out what they are. This can take a long time. There are nine questions he asks in total. I think the puzzle would have been better if there were only five questions. One per shape? That would make sense. I don't think this puzzle is bad. I just think it's kind of dumb. I, I know people hate it, but I don't hate it. I'm just like, ugh, this is a dumb waste of my time. Urgh, darn Topham. Once you solve the puzzle, you get the quartz. Waddell charges $2 to cut it. Come back to him later to get it. Now you can use the ham radio. You call the three people and give each one of them the correct cue. This was a fine puzzle, just kind of long. The problem is that all three conversations are similar. Since Nancy has to tell each person about Josiah's death and the Shakespeare cue, you can ask a follow-up question to the first person you call, while the other two will automatically hang up on you. So, you have the three sentences from them, and the one in the note to Gloria. They contain phrases used in hobo sign language. You enter the symbols on the clock in the correct order, do this for all four sentences, and you get another puzzle! You have to press the cards to move to the end of the board. Each card can be used once, and you can take shortcuts if you land on the starting square and use its symbol. It's not a bad puzzle. It's kind of neat, actually, but I feel like it's out of place. It comes out of nowhere, and I don't see any connection between it and the Q's puzzle you just solved. I think the game should have skipped this puzzle entirely. Nobody would notice the difference, and it makes more sense to have this big, giant cues puzzle, the one that we spent so much work solving, be the final puzzle leading to the will. So once you solve um, the little symbols puzzle, the clock machine turns on. It gives you a gold golf ball. A note says to score a hole-in-one on the golf course. You can't find his will unless you're good at mini-golf. No wonder nobody found it! When Nancy goes to the golf course, a brick floats up and reveals a secret spot that gives you an easy hole-in-one. The sad part is, even if I could use this all the time, I'd probably still have trouble getting par. You get another safe deposit key. On the way to her car, Nancy overhears an argument between Emily and Jane. I thought this was a pointless distraction. We're at the end of the game. We finally got the key to the will. Do we really need to go through this now? I guess we do, because the game teleports you inside uh, the inn. Emily woke up from a nap. She found one of the stolen necklaces in her hand. She's convinced she's having a nervous breakdown. And Jane agrees, it's all in Emily's head. Nancy's response is to ignore what's going on, because it's not important compared to the will. I agree, it's not important. That's why there was no need to force her into this scene at the last second. Nancy gives the key to Mr. Archer. She says she got it by acing one of the holes. Ace in the hole! That's Clara Pickford's nickname for Mr. Archer! I didn't like this either. It's kind of a dumb coincidence that Nancy uses that particular phrase, and Clara is such a minor character that this big revelation doesn't land. Players aren't going to gasp in surprise. They're more likely to ask, wait, who's Clara again? They find Josiah's will, but Nancy completely ignores it. Urgh, why do you ignore the main point of the game, Nancy? You're killing me! Nancy completely ignores it in favor of a picture of Gloria and Jane taken 18 years ago. Nancy realizes Jane is an imposter. Gee, it sure is lucky Josiah included this picture with his will just in case someone was impersonating Jane after his death. Nancy confronts Jane, just as Jane is leaving in a hurry. Presumably, she's going to sell the stolen jewels and flee the state. I have no idea why she waited until now to do this instead of leaving right away. Nancy and Jane have a car chase, and this is an excellent endgame challenge. I like it. You have to follow Jane. If her car goes off screen at any point, you lose. Jane uses the same path each time, so if you fail a lot, you can memorize her route. After about a half minute, Nancy decides to cut her off at the state line in the upper right. Go there to see Jane crash into the pie delivery truck. 
There is a satisfying scene of Jane covered with pies. She deserves that for making you do the pie challenge. Nancy's ending letter is to Ned. Hi, Ned! You live in 1932? I wonder why that didn't get mentioned earlier. Nancy explains that Jane was Marion Aborn in disguise. She intercepted Emily's letter to Jane and hatched this overly complicated scheme to trick Emily into selling Lilac in so she could run off with money. I'm a little surprised she didn't just steal stuff and run after the first week. Jane does not strike me as a long-term fraudster. Josiah's will gives money to Emily and Mr. Archer while leaving Topham penniless. Topham promises to contest the will, but he's probably going to lose because he is a will-forging culprit. That's Secret of the Old Clock. Overall, I enjoy the game. It's got a nice, upbeat setting with plenty of good puzzles. It's not my top five favorite games by any stretch of the imagination, but I would rather play this than Ghost Dogs of Moon Lake or Secret of Shadow Ranch. It does have problems. Sewing, mini golf, and the chore run are the glaring problems. Still, I think this game doesn't get the credit it deserves, probably because it's sandwiched between two straight-up fantastic games. They make this game look bad by comparison. I give Nancy Drew number 12, Secret of the Old Clock, an 8 out of 10, basically taking off a point for sewing and mini-golf.